Club community is very active. Right now, we're onboarding over 2,000 entrepreneurs per month, and it's really amazing. If you are, like, for example, looking for a co-founder on the business development front or a co-founder on the engineering front, you can go to co-founders lab, meet your match, and then eventually uh, uh, seek a round of funding that is going to be raised uh, on one base, hopefully, right? So this is really uh, quickly the financing piece of the network that we're building, which is one uh, There we connect early stage uh, startups with accredited investors. So this is the way it looks like you can browse through the deals. There is a due diligence report that is offered, the way the dashboard looks for investors. So it's pretty nice. I feel very, very proud of the work that uh, our team has done, especially on the, on the product side. They're actually next to me, so they're probably laughing and smiling at it. So um, anyways, uh, some of the success stories that we've had uh, include speech trends, which uh, uh, raised uh, nicely uh, the amount that you're able to see on display there. Imperative is a, is a story that is actually uh, uh, deep in my heart because they were one of the first uh, success stories that went from co-founders lab graduating into OneBest and being able to close a successful round of financing on the OneBest ecosystem. So that really validated the acquisition that we did of co-founders lab last year to really create that funnel that would support the founder from the formation to the financing front. So Stylent is another company that graduated from Y Combinator and then a really nice success story, SumXR, which is right now the best selling drink, energy drink on Whole Foods. So let's talk about what we're going to be uh, discussing today during this webinar. So we are going to have a, basically the discussion of the different fundraising sources that you find out there, some of the terms that you're going to find were raising money, and then as well the pros and cons of taking outside investment. There's always a responsibility that comes with that, and as well a, what happens when you decide to raise money and what people look for, what to include, and then as well the, some of the regulatory framework that you, for example, have seen or have read on some of the media outlets uh, out there. We're going to leave uh, 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers. You have here on your computer, on the GoToWebinar control panel, there is a question section. There you can ask any questions, uh, now or later. Uh, I have my, my colleague Ben here that is helping me out uh, on, the, on the back end. So if you're having any technical difficulties or issues, please feel free to reach out to him and, and we'll try to get that fixed as soon as possible. So let's see what's, uh, what kind of uh, uh, sources do you have to raise money. So obviously the, the, the best one and the one that I do recommend the most is, is bootstrapping. If you can really build a business uh, that is financed by the money from your customers, that's the most amazing thing because that way you're going to be avoiding any type of dilution that comes with uh, raising a round of funding, right? So uh, if uh, you've already passed through the bootstrapping phase or you really need to accelerate the process and for that you need additional cash, then perhaps there's different ways of doing such thing at a very early stage, like for example, accepting money from friends and family or from angels if you've already passed uh, that phase and then you can combine, for example, a round of a, a crowdfunding or a angel a, a investor money. So on the crowdfunding front, really quickly, there's different sources, and I think that there's some confusion with uh, how it works and, and what's the nature of it. So you have, on one end, the donation-based crowdfunding, and you have a bunch of sites out there that are doing this, and that's a really good route if you're able to raise money without giving equity away. I mean. Uh, on this side, basically what you're doing is you're pre-selling your product and people are paying for it. So it's really making a monetary contribution in exchange for a tangible reward, which, you know, it's appealing for these folks. Uh, but, you know, when you're, for example, running a tech startups or something that is not really tangible, the donation-based crowdfunding route is a little bit tougher to actually execute on. The next uh, type of, of flavor of crowdfunding is the equity crowdfunding and that's what for example what we do at OneBest and what it what it basically equity crowdfunding what it is is the fact that you are raising money uh, that is investments it's not donations so in exchange for the contributions or the, for the investments that you receive you are giving away a percentage of ownership in your business there is obviously different ways of structuring these rounds and we're going to be talking about that today 
but that's really the, the nature of equity crowdfunding. And then the last one is peer-to-peer -peer lending, but that's more from an individual perspective, and it's all about the striking date and the interest that you're accruing on your investment. So really quickly here, talking about accelerators. Accelerators is another form of <coughs> kicking in the high gear your company. I think that there's a ton of accelerator programs out there. I think that there's so many of them that it's just hard to keep track. So I think that you should all have a clear understanding of the value add that that accelerator is going to provide you and your company. And uh, it's, it's really a, a small uh, symbolic amount what they're giving you in exchange for the equity that they receive. I mean, we're talking about tickets from 10 to 20 and some uh, accelerators are going all the way up to 50 and, and perhaps a little bit more. Uh, but it's a significant uh, equity ownership. I mean, we're looking at uh, anywhere between 5 to 15 that they're asking from from companies in terms of, of percentage of equity. So you really need to understand what they're going to be doing, how they're going to be helping. I mean, some of these accelerators are good because they are able to give some mentorship, some guidance. Perhaps they can connect you with uh, some potential uh, partners, uh, with some, uh, I would say, a, a talent in your team, or perhaps uh, financing. I mean, on these demo days that you see on these companies, uh, on these accelerators, sorry, there is a lot of investors that are invited and that's the time where you actually get some good tickets. So with that being said, let's go to the next thing, the next thing, the next slide here. Uh, we kind of like covered everything, but everything, I would say that everything below Series A round of financing is what I would call seed. Uh, now those seed rounds have a really varied a lot since 2005. The industry at an early stage has really changed. And I think that the, this really, this, all these people that are investing and the way the entrepreneur is financing their venture is doing it via, for example, angels, the friends and family that we talked about before. Banks is a really tough way to do it. And then another uh, way of really financing your venture as an entrepreneur is either by the savings that you have or with credit cards. But I don't uh, recommend doing the credit cards because it's a, a really tricky game. You don't really want to find yourself in a situation in which is going to be really tough because when you are, uh, for example, accruing all that debt, uh, then whenever you go into, for example, a venture capital round or a really significant angel round or a seed round in this case, um, what's going to happen is that they're going to do background checks and you, the, the last thing that you want is to have any uh, red flags coming from bankruptcies or any of that stuff that perhaps you may incur if you are using methods of this nature. So. Let's talk about some of the key terminology that you're going to be finding. And by the way, don't be shy. Please ask your questions here on the GoToWebinar control panel. My colleague here, Ben, is uh, feeling, not, not, feeling, not feeling a lot of action on his end, so please submit the questions his way. So anyway, so some of the key terminology, the cap table. So what is the cap table? When you are uh, raising money, there is, a, there is really a structure, right? And, and when you establish that company, the cap table, what it, what it outlines is the percentage of ownership that every single a key player in the business or investor uh, has. So as you continue to expand and as you continue to um, raise more money, this cap table is going to show the percentage of ownership and the equity stakes that each individual has in that company. And that is going to vary uh, as the company continues to move forward. So the valuation is very straightforward. It's really the value of your company that is going to be established by, by the round itself and by the investors. And the term sheet, and, and, and this is a really tricky one, the term sheet is really not a, a commitment to invest. It's a promise to invest. Uh, the term sheet really is a summary of the terms of the round and how people may or may not uh, be coming in and how, um, for example, the rights that they're going to receive in exchange for their investment. So some of the big mistakes that I've seen that entrepreneurs do is that when they receive a term sheet, they feel like the round it's, it's, it's done, that they're going to get the money in the bank. And that's, that's very dangerous because the problem that you're going to have is that you may perhaps increase the burn rate of your business and uh, basically what, what that is going to do is that if that money is not finally coming in, hold on one second, I'm just checking in that there is no technical issues. Anyway, so 
basically what happens is that if the money is not coming in at the end or the term sheet falls through, then you're going to be left holding the bag. And the last thing that you want is to increase the, the burn rate, uh, increase basically the cost of your company, and then know that there's no way to really finance that. So really be careful with that. I've had a couple of uh, uh, friends and colleagues and, and peers that they have had to, to shut down the doors because they had a term sheet fall through. So really keep that in mind and don't take the fireworks out until the round is closed and the money's in the bank. So let's talk about now the, the different ways of, of structuring, right, an equity offering. You can structure it via convertible notes or, for example, via equity rounds. Convertible notes can come also in the flavor of, of safe notes, which is a, what uh, entities like Y Combinator are, have really put in uh, and given a, a lot of popularity. But really the convertible notes, what they are, is an instrument to raise money, which is much faster and much cheaper than an equity round, in which there is two documents. Uh, one is the uh, note purchase agreement, uh, in which you outline the terms, and then the promissory note, uh, once you've received the investment, like what's exactly the structure. Well, so when you're raising money via a convertible note, um, really what um, it's important is three things. One is the interest that you're giving investors for uh, the money that they're giving you and how that is going to be accruing them the interest over the course of time. Uh, two is going to be the, the discount that they're going to be receiving on the next round of financing. And then three, if there is a cap on the valuation, meaning a ceiling uh, that is established so that uh, they're not going to go over that in the event that you raise a round of financing down the road that is uh, quite as, at a significant, uh, a much more amount than the cap itself. So the discount and the cap, they are very interesting for the investors. So the discount uh, basically is going to give them a discount on the valuation that is established by the leading investor on the next round of financing. And the cap amount is uh, basically the same, the same thing. I mean, you're really, uh, well, it's not the same thing, but it's really establishing a valuation on your uh, note. Uh, so meaning that the uh, uh, investors that come in, they're going to be investing at that specific valuation cap. So the, the discounts and so forth are really going to take a, a really importance when the trigger uh, of the next subsequent qualified round of financing happens. So why a convertible note is uh, it's good? It's good because you're not really specifically putting together an equity round in which there's a clear valuation on the company established. You're kind of like delaying the process a little bit. I've seen uh, convertible notes that don't have a cap. So you are basically riding the wave until the next round of financing and waiting for that sophisticated angel or venture capital that actually puts the, the cap, uh, uh, sorry, the, the valuation itself on the business. And then you have the, the equity rounds, right? So the equity rounds, basically you need a lead. Uh, basically that is going to come in, establish the terms of the offering, and then at the end, you're gonna have everyone else coming in uh, at the same terms. So there is two types of shares that are going to be giving, uh, for the most part, at an early stage uh, financing when you're doing an equity round. So one is the common stock. Uh, this is, for the most part, the one that uh, employees, uh, board uh, members, uh, advisors, and so forth are gonna have, and perhaps some investors. Uh, and then you have the preferred stock, which basically is the one that you're gonna be granting when you continue to move forward on the equity financings, uh, perhaps at a series A and, and subsequent rounds of financing. So the difference really between the common and the preferred is the rights that are associated to that specific stock that you are uh, issuing. So for example, the preferred stock normally uh, comes with liquid, liquidation preferences. And then for example, as well with the fact that in the event uh, the company gets acquired or there is a liquidity event, uh, they're coming first in line, meaning that they're going to be cashing out before the common stockholders. So the dilution, what is really the dilution? So the dilution comes when there is a, a round of financing that the company has raised. Obviously, I mean, for example, if you hold 50% and uh, of your company and then uh, there is a round of financing, that is going to be uh, decreasing, right, in terms of the amount that you hold in the business. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, you are also increasing the value of that stock that you're holding. So ultimately, you know, it's a, 
it's it's it has the positive and then the negative. It depends on the valuation that you're raising at. You always want to do an up round uh, with with concerning or compared to the one that you raised in the past. So, like Mark even says, it's better to have one percent of four billion than to have a hundred percent of nothing. So don't be greedy. Uh, try to get the right people uh, on the right seats, the right people to help you push your venture, and that's in my opinion the way to move things forward. So let's throw in a question here so that we know who we are dealing with uh, today. So I'm going to actually launch myself this question. So the question is, have you ever tried raising money for a startup before? So let me launch this on my end and let's see what are your responses. Let's see here the responses that we're receiving. Let's see. Let's see, please answer here. I don't know, for some reason, Ben, it's not showing on my end the go to winner thing. Let me see if I can if I can find it because those polls sometimes are a little bit tricky. Anyways, I don't know what's happening with the with the poll itself, but let's continue to move forward on the next uh, slide. So, the next slide: How long does it take to raise money? And and while we are continuing with the presentation, my uh, colleagues here are going to find out what's the what's wrong with the with the poll itself. But how long does it take to raise money? So, in the in, I would say offline world for early stages, especially if you're doing like a seed or a Series A round. Normally, it's going to take on average anywhere between six months to nine months. So um, that's why, uh, for example, platforms like OneBase or, or other sources like the ones we discussed before, they really help, help in streamlining the process of getting that money in so that you don't have to waste time with going to conferences and educating people that have never heard of, of your venture before. I mean, ultimately, as a founder, the most valuable resource that you have is time, and you want to make sure that you're allocating your time in building the business, not in fundraising 24-7. So with that being said, I mean, you have uh, now, uh, like I mentioned, uh, those uh, equity platforms in which you're able to blast your community directly, and those are the people that are already followers of what you're doing, fans of what you're doing, and that don't need additional education. Those are the people that are willing to jump in right off the bat. I mean, ourselves, for example, we launched our round on our own platform, which you can see on invest.onebase.com, and we're really satisfied with how things have been shaping up so far. I mean, I haven't really moved from my desk uh, to do investor meetings, and, and that was pretty awesome. So, let me see here. It seems like we had some issues here with the slides. Are they already showing, Ben? Let's close the poll, and we're not going to be launching more polls, Ben, because it's uh, we're having some technical problems with that. So anyways, so can you see my slides now? Can you guys see my slides now? So sorry for the technical difficulties. Can you see them, Ben? OK, one second. Let me see. All right, I think that you guys should be seeing my slides now, correct? Not yet? Yeah, let's see. Let's see if it's working now. So the next slide, anyways, um, now it's working, right? Okay, so the next slide that we have here is, uh, should I be taking money outside? Yes or no? And I think that uh, this is a, a pretty important question that you should be asking yourself as an entrepreneur. Hold on. Let's see. Sorry, guys. We're here having some troubles. And um, I'm going to be putting my slides now full screen. And now it's working. So. Uh, show, should I take outside investment? So I think that when you're taking outside investment, people are really uh, thinking about just the money itself, but with raising money, there is a additional responsibility. 
Uh, let's talk about the pros first. So the pros are the fact that you're going to be able to really speed up uh, the process. When my advice is that do not raise money for building the machine. Raise money to speed up the machine. And some of the pros of doing such thing is the fact that you're going to go faster, that you're going to have more supporters, more people helping you with the venture itself, and also the fact that you're going to be able to have more, but more of a budget to go out and hire a, a individuals that are going to help you if you seat them on the right seats to move things along and execute the way you should to get to the promised land, which is ultimately what every single entrepreneur wants. So let's see here. Uh, the cons that you may have is the fact that uh, you're going to have to give up equity. I mean, obviously, that's not a really fun part, but again, I told you that uh, sometimes, uh, or you know, many times, giving up equity uh, in exchange for 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 the for the money that they're investing, it makes sense, especially depending on the profile. I mean, sometimes they're going to help you in uh, doing business development deals, uh, building partnerships, raising subsequent routes of financing. So that know-how it's uh, it's key. So the cons that you're going to have is the fact that you're going to have to be reporting these guys. There's going to be expectations set on, on, on what you're doing. I mean, every quarter they're going to be looking at how you increased or how you decreased in terms of uh, the progress of your business. And there's really more and more answers to provide. So, I mean, if, if you're ready to do that, go ahead and, and raise money. And if not, just keep you know, building it. So, how do I decide how much money to raise? I think that this is a tricky question. I guess that um, ultimately what you want is, is enough money to be able to hit your milestones. There is some, some people that uh, tell you that you should be raising uh, only the necessary uh, that you need for your venture to execute, and then there's other people that uh, tell you raise all the money that you can. I mean, my, 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 I'm a big fan of raising all the money that you can because you never know when the market is going to turn around and you don't want to be... Uh, you know, really uh, finding yourself in a really bad situation, but ultimately the the amount of money that you're going to be one that you really want to raise is uh, uh, for the next uh, 18 to 24 months of of runway. And when I talk about runway, and I'm sure that many of you have heard about the word runway when uh, you know raising money or when you know you're speaking with investors or so forth or internally, really runway what it is 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 the amount of the I would say road that you have to really take off, to have your company take off. I mean, imagine a plane, you know, about to take off, they need enough runway to be able to fly. And that happens the same thing with startups. You want to have enough time and enough money to, to finance that time to really execute on the plans that you have established for yourself, for your team and the company. So what do investors look for? Um, so when you're really racing around, um, what they're going to be looking at uh, when reviewing your deal is the team, obviously. I mean, they want to know what are your backgrounds, why are you guys the right ones to execute on this plan, uh, what's the idea really looking like. In any case, idea is, the ideas are, are meaningless without the right execution. What's the traction? I mean, when we're talking about traction is what amount of customers that you have, what's the acquisition strategy. Uh, the revenues, how is this progressing over time? So really the KPIs, the metrics that you're pushing. No? Uh, then also what's the market opportunity? The market opportunity is really important because the market is going to determine uh, really what kind of exit they're going to be looking, like, uh, looking at down the line. So I would, uh, I'm actually just looking now for something, but anyways, uh, basically the, the market is going to determine uh, how many returns they're going to be getting when they make the investment. So you could have a great team, uh, you know, all everything, everything like really positive on the on the deal itself, but maybe you know the market it just doesn't make sense. It's, it's probably maybe like too small. And that's going to really uh, make them uh, perhaps take a step back and think about it twice. And then as well the competition. I mean who else is on your space? I mean what advantage do you have over them? How are you gonna be able to really do things better and faster than them? I mean those are all questions that you need to be prepared to, uh, to answer. When you're racing around, uh, you need to keep in mind that they're going to be asking you the same things over and over and over again. So I would say I would throw in a, a, a suggestion there for all of you and uh, basically write all these questions and all these answers uh, uh, down. Write them down and that way you have them and you don't have to repeat yourself over and over and over again. 
And that way you just have them canned and it's just one click and you're able to just reply to these people the same thing. So let's talk about the pitch stick. What to include on the pitch stick. So I really, uh, I mean, we come across uh, a lot of pitch sticks. Right now we're looking at over 250 deals per month. Uh, but really the one of the biggest problems that I see is that people are not able to really create a compelling story in a very short period of time. The people that are reviewing your pitch decks, all these investors, they really, um, they're looking at a lot of pitch decks and uh, you want to make sure that you need to be as as articulate and as a really, a, as good as you can really at telling the story of what you're doing. Uh, ultimately, the best founders are not the best visioners or the best salespeople and you really need to sell the vision and the mission and what you're doing as best as possible. So. Do not include more than 20 slides. That's my uh, recommendation. You really want to make sure that you are, for example, putting in there what's the progress, what's the traction, who is the team, uh, what's the size of the market, the competition, some of the competitors. I would say that, for example, including a diagram where you're putting like each each competitor like in different buckets and then putting yourself in a different bucket showing why you're different and why your company is a potential winner in the space. I think that that's a definitely helpful. And then as well, how much money are you raising? When you're putting how much money you're raising, I think that this is a, a tricky slide because uh, there is many investors that don't go above certain ranges or below certain ranges in terms of ticket size. So basically, instead of saying I'm raising this specific amount of money, let's say I'm raising a uh, four million or five million. Just try to keep it a little bit more broad. Maybe try to say I'm raising between three to five million. So that way you're not losing the people that are under uh, five million and then also the people that perhaps are over three million. So with that being said, the financial projections, you can just include there like, you know, basically a three or four years. You don't have to really be really detailed, but at least really give an overview of how that's looking like. And then of course at the beginning, don't forget to include the solution to the problem that you're resolving. So you've raised money. Now what's next? So basically when you raise money, you need to have a, a clear alignment, a clear expectation. I mean, on my end, uh, I've, I've been able to raise uh, over $4.2 million uh, for, for startups, uh, specifically for OneVest itself. And one of the things that uh, I'm, I, I really want to make sure that people understand is that us as founders, we're in business to make our investors money. And that's why they're investing in us, to give them returns on their investment. And you cannot be uh, focusing yourself on answering emails day in, day out, because otherwise you're not going to be able to focus on what matters, which is your business. So I think that it's important that you are establishing expectations early on with your investors that they understand what type of communication you're going to be having with them and that as a result of that, uh, you're going to be able to address perhaps their concerns or their questions or to address or to, or to really communicate the progress that your venture is experiencing over the course of time but really on a quarterly basis. I mean, there's some people that do it on a monthly basis but really establish that with the investors so that they know when they're going to be hearing from you and that way you're really not uh, answering emails of how you're doing 24-7. There are some investors that perhaps it makes sense to have involved, uh, some that like to get active and that perhaps have that value add and that expertise and experience that is going to help you to shape things up a little bit faster. So really be able to, uh, to know who is going to be able to add what and how you're going to be able to use them and communicate that clearly with them. So that's my, my piece of advice. And of course celebrate. However, raising money guys is not a, is not a milestone. Raising a round of financing is a stepping stone. So uh, I would suggest uh, not drinking too much wine and reserving some of that champagne for the rest of the journey. So the Jobs Act, let's talk about the Jobs Act and, and, and the Jobs Act, all this regulatory landscape that is happening, how it's going to be affecting you guys and uh, how you really can take a, a, or how you can really take ownership and use it so that you're more successful in raising your, your capital. So there is a, the Jobs Act, really quickly, uh, what it is is this new law that, this, this new uh, framework that was signed into law by Obama uh, in April of 2012, that included the possibility for companies to uh, advertise the fact that they were raising money. 
meaning that you can now use uh, blogs, you can use social media. This was completely forbidden, by the way, for the past 80 years. So uh, with the Securities and Exchange Act of 1933, uh, once that was implemented, I mean, for, for that and, and, and after that, it was, it was impossible to go out and, and really tell the world how uh, you were raising money and what, vali what valuation and so forth. So the Title II is what really uh, helps to do that. And the Title II was implemented on uh, 2013, September of 2013, and that allows you to go to your biggest supporters and tell them that you're raising money. So that's, a, that's pretty amazing. So uh, now instead of having to educate people and be one-on-one on the phone, now you can just shoot a newsletter, for example, and drive them to a, to a page that you might have in which you're raising money. So. That's for the Title II of the Jobs Act. Now let's jump to Title III and Title IV of the Jobs Act. So Title IV of the Jobs Act was uh, implemented actually last month. It was on June uh, 19th. And uh, basically Title IV allows companies to raise up to 50 million from accredited and non-accredited investors. This is, this is huge, guys. And the reason for this is because um, during the past 80 years, only accredited investors were able to invest in your company. And accredited investors are those folks that have either over $1 million in assets or that are making over $200,000 in income per year. So that's just 1% of the U.S. population or 8 million Americans. So now with this past law, now you're able to really raise money from accredited and non-accredited people. So that means that instead of being limited to just 8 million, now you can go to over 300 million Americans and get them excited about what you're doing and get them in. Title IV, it has uh, some limitations, so I would encourage you to, for example, go, you can go to, to onebase.com to the website, and you can see there uh, on, on the homepage itself more information about how Title IV works, but uh, really get educated because this, uh, this is heavy regulated, and you want to make sure that you're doing the right things. We uh, pride ourselves from really helping out uh, entrepreneurs with our service, so uh, feel free to reach out as well. So the Title III is the one that is more concerning to startups. I think that my piece of advice is that only use Title IV if you're more on the growth stage. So that means that you're doing a Series A and up. Uh, my, my, I would say, recommendation here is that if you're raising anywhere under three million or four million, maybe it's not gonna make sense for you to do a Title IV because there is a lot of fees that you're gonna have to pay along the way to actually make that a possibility. So Title III is a little bit cheaper, but it also has some limits. So with Title III, you're only able to raise uh, up to one million, and there is also some reporting and different factors that you need to take into consideration. This has not been implemented yet. There is some uh, rumors and word on the street is that it's going to potentially happen in October, but we're still waiting, right? I mean, this was supposed to be implemented on, on 2013, and, and it hasn't happened yet. So. Uh, anyways, about Title III, what I would suggest is that probably it doesn't make sense if you're raising under 500000 because of all the fees that you're going to have to do and the reporting and, and all that burden. So um, do some, some research on that. I mean, we have a great blog, blog.wambes.com, and we cover all these uh, different factors if you want to get additional education. So let's talk now about the pros of equity crowdfunding by the way i hate the word crowdfunding i think that the uh, crowdfunding is a is a trend and, and my feeling is that this is uh, what platforms uh, are doing in the in the equity space in the financing space for startups is really revolutionizing what was a old and outdated industry that hadn't changed for 80 years so i think that crowdfunding is more of like a trend and i find that these platforms are not to be biased, like for example, Wambis, uh, they're here to stay. So let's talk about now uh, what are some of the positive things about raising money via equity crowdfunding. I touched on this uh, uh, before, but it's actually not mentioned here. But my biggest, um, I would say, positive thing about equity crowdfunding uh, is something that I've been able to live myself. Uh, during this uh, past month, we've been, as I mentioned earlier to you guys, uh, we've raised a, on our own platform. We've actually self-crowdfunded ourselves. It was really scary. I was literally throwing myself into a pool, and I didn't know whether it was going to be water in there or not. Thank God there was water, so I didn't come out with any broken bones. But, um, but yeah, you can actually see this by going to invest.onebest.com and 
And thank God, I mean, things have been uh, unfolded the way we planned it. We had amazing support. But the coolest thing about that was the fact that I didn't have to go to conferences. I didn't have to educate people that had no idea about what this was all about. I, I was able to communicate and articulate what we were doing with that round and how we were uh, using those funds with the people that already knew about OneBest. So the amount of time of educating people, getting on the phone and doing all that stuff was really significantly reduced. So, I mean, on my end as a founder, it was extremely helpful to have one place where I could just drive all my network into and then also people that, you know, I could uh, perhaps say, uh, you know, they would see this uh, somewhere uh, so that they could come in and do everything in a very seamless process without having to do emails back and forth. I mean, everything happened online on the platform uh, with the transactions and all this kind of stuff. So you're not like sharing and exchanging attachments uh, uh, back and forth. So obviously, like I mentioned before, it's the larger pool of investors. Now you're able to really advertise and market this. You can use blog posts. You can use social media. Uh, you can use platforms like, for example, ours. We have this thing called the digital demo days in which the companies that are actually posted on the platform, we put them to pitch in front of a large audience of accredited investors. Uh, for the most part, this tends to be anywhere between 100, 150 to all the way up to 400 accredited investors. And that's pretty amazing because uh, for any founder, that would take anywhere between one to two years to actually get those introductions happening to actually pitch to that amount, that amount of, of investors. So. The, uh, the other thing is that there is a smaller minimums uh, amounts. So for example, in the offline world, it's much uh, tougher to really get into startup deals uh, because there is a minimum that is established to get in. So for example, what I'm seeing is anywhere between 50,000 to 150,000 to actually be part of these rounds. And that could be problematic because it doesn't really help the investor to do the most important thing, which is to, to diversify. So now we think, uh, with this type of, of arrangements and the, with this kind of structures that platforms do, now you're able to, for example, get people at $5,000, at $10,000, at $15,000, and in a way in which it's going to be looking clean in your cap table. We, for example, at OneBase, we're structuring all these investments that are coming in, and we put them into an investment vehicle so that they count as one on your cap table, uh, and you can have up to 99 investors per investment vehicle. So that's pretty cool because you, uh, are not going to have to chase uh, 99 people for signatures. You're just going to have to be in communication with one entity, with the managing member of that entity that is essentially the one that is going to be representing everyone else. So that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. So let's talk about the next uh, point. So one of the other things that you have with equity crowdfunding is that you are able to have more people involved. Uh, you are able to have, uh, obviously right now, only um, really accredited investors for uh, the type of offerings that we have are allowed, uh, the ones, the offerings that are going to be approved by the SEC, those will also be able to have the uh, non-accredited people, which are the, the Reggae Plus type of offerings or Title IV of the Jobs Act. But really with, uh, with this third point, uh, it's important to take into consideration that as a founder, you're going to need a lot of advice to cover a lot of holes. So the fact that now you have a larger pool of people to come in and to push things forward it gives you more, um, I would say, reach and, and, and also advantage when trying to, for example, close partnerships, uh, doing you know, other stuff that you know, all, all these individuals may be able to provide with their connections, with their networks, and then also, of course, with their uh, expertise. So with that being said, we're going to jump into some questions here. So uh, please feel free to uh, go into your GoToWebinar control panel and there you will be able to uh, type in your question. I will be receiving it on my end, and uh, I will be answering. I will try to answer uh, as much as possible, but hopefully we have time to, to do so. So let's see here. All right. Um, so question from Neku. So Neku is asking, what types of teams get funded? So I think that they, like I mentioned before, the, the team is, is critical, right? I guess that when you're looking at a, at a, at a company, especially from a, an investor's perspective, uh, the team, the market, the idea, um, the traction, all that is important, but there's one more thing that is even more important, which is at, to be at the right time in history. 
Uh, but anyways, now moving to your question, Nico, uh, the team is critical. What you want to make sure is that <clears throat> you have like that book, uh, which is Jim Collins, uh, Good to Great. Like he says, you need to make sure that you're having, you have the right people seated on the right seats of the bus so that eventually you're able to find the direction of your company. Uh, because at the end of the day, you're not going to have all the answers when you're building a, a company. But what I'd like to say is that when you're putting your pitch together, when you're articulating uh, in your conversation with investors, make sure that you're able to really give them the idea of who is behind your company. What can they add? What can they provide? What are they going to help to make you guys be different, to execute faster than your competitors? So when you're looking at building your team, try to really have people that you can delegate on, that you can trust that they're going to be able to execute without you having to be there on top of them. And I think that if you're able to really get the right people, uh, investors definitely will get excited and your deal will get funded. I think that without a good team or without being able to showcase that, it's going to be really tough to get people excited. If you're not able to get uh, excited people to join you, how are you going to be able to get uh, investors to join you as well? So let's see the next question. So the, the, the next question comes from Wenceslau, and his question is, what is the best way to price your company for investment? So the best, way, the best way to price your company is uh, either by having a lead investor that is uh, someone sophisticated that, you know, has done this in the past, that knows what may be the value of your company. You can, for example, look at the revenues that you have. I think that it, it's an early stage uh, company. It's a little bit tricky, the revenues, especially if you're at a pre-revenue stage and you want to get money in. So there's some other things that you want to take a look at. For example, is the... The, the, the KPIs, the acquisition strategy that you have of users, what's the, how, what, what, what is the recurring revenue perhaps that you are uh, pulling in. So those are all really good factors. And then another way to price your venture is to see uh, what other competitors are doing, competitors that perhaps have the same amount of traction that your company has, and seeing what is the pre-money valuation that they are racing at, and perhaps to, to do something around that neighborhood as well. Really quickly, pre-money valuation is the price that you're putting on your company, and post-money valuation is the money, is the value of your company once the investments have come in from that round of financing. So hopefully, Wenceslao, that answer your that answer your question. So uh, the next question. So the next question comes from Sabu, and his question is: What traction are investors looking for? I think that some of these questions are a little bit tricky, uh, especially because uh, traction comes in different flavors, and also it depends on the market that you're operating and and what's your vertical and you know the size of your of your company, what life cycle are you in, and and so forth. But really, traction. When we're talking about traction, it could be measured in different ways. It could be measuring your revenue. It could be measuring your customers. It could be measured for example, in your investors, in the investments that you've been able to, to, to get for your rounds of financing and so forth. So that's a little bit more a question on your end, Sabu, to, to actually define and to do some research on, on your market itself. So let's see what's the next question that we have here, guys. I'm receiving them on my end, so feel free to send them over. So. The next question is from Travis, and his question is, do you have to change an LLC to a regular C-Corp in order to take investors? So I think, Travis, that that's a more of a legal question, and even though I'm a recovering lawyer still seeking therapy, by the way, uh, I have to say that uh, if I was to be uh, starting my company again, uh, uh, for example, OneBest, I would definitely start it again as a, as a C-Corp, because C-Corps have the, uh, they're easier, uh, they're easier to do subsequent rounds of financing, and also they're uh, more friendly with Delaware and with doing IPOs and, and so forth. So that's, for example, the way I would look at it. But for this, Travis, you're going to need some legal advice. So let's see the next question. So the next question comes from Veronica, and Veronica is having some uh, doubts on the convertible notes. She's asking if I could talk a little bit more about the convertible notes and perhaps give some example of terms. So 
obviously the terms that you're going to be putting for your convertible note, this is more of a question for your lawyer, but I can tell you from what I've been seeing in the market. What I've been seeing in the market is convertible notes that range between 5 to 8% in interest, so that's money that the, the, the investors are going to be receiving as interest on the investment that they're putting in until you're converting your convertible note into equity, which comes at a qualified financing, meaning at the next run of financing that you are doing. Uh, then you have the discount. What I'm seeing is around 25%, anywhere from 20 to 25%. And that what happens is a, a discount on the next valuation. So for example, if you're raising a next, a, the next qualified financing is let's say a $20 million pre-money valuation, basically the people that are converting into the run of financing, they're not coming in at 20, a 20, pre -money, uh, a 20 million pre-money valuation. They're coming in at a 25% discount over the 20 million, and that's the value that they're coming in. And then uh, finally, the, the valuation cap that I was mentioning. So the valuation cap really is the, the ceiling that you're putting in. Uh, this is, I mean, you can either put this or not. Uh, it's up to you. Some investors like it. You know, some investors don't mind it, uh, but uh, don't mind about it. But really, the, the cap, what it gives is the assurance to the investor that no matter what, let's say if you're putting a valuation cap of 5 million and your next round comes in at uh, 20 million, that means that those investors are not going to be converting at the 20 million, they're going to be converting at the 5 million regardless of what's going to be your next uh, pre-money valuation. So hopefully, Veronica, that gave some color on the convertible notes. So let's see the next question. Um, let's see. So the next question comes from Alex. So Alex is asking if, if by being registered uh, with his company in Canada, can he use OneBest? So at this point, OneBest is only a, a allowed for compliance purposes by a, for companies that are a, incorporated here in the US. So uh, if you're, for example, incorporated in Canada, perhaps look at incorporating in the, in the US and then having some operational structure so that you can actually apply to OneBest and we can take a look at it on our end. Uh, we do accept foreign investors though, so uh, that's it. There's definitely no problems with that. So, let's see the next question. So the next question comes from Isa. And Isa uh, is asking where and how do you find the investors in order to be given the opportunity to pitch to them? So. This is a, a really interesting question, Isa. I think that there is so many channels out there that you can use to get in front of investors. I think that now with the online world, it, it's more transparent and there's more transparency in the way you are able to access uh, these folks. Um, I think that uh, venture capital firms, for example, the best way is really to get an introduction because they use that as social proof. And then also, uh, for example, you can use online platforms like ours and like others that are out there to really uh, get in front of people without really having to do the roadshow. So there's also conferences. You can go to all these event, uh, uh, I would say, companies like Eventbrite, or you can see Meetup and see when there is uh, events that are happening where you can get in front of, this, of these guys that they can see your face, where you can really establish that relationship so that you can pitch them, secure a meeting. When you are uh, with an investor, you need to make sure that uh, you're always looking for the next meeting uh, and, and, and really let them uh, be the ones that are doing the closing. Don't try to put the deal down their throat. Otherwise, you're going to be uh, really uh, turning them off. So hopefully, Isa, that provided some, uh, some perspective. Also, use social media. Try to see, uh, for example, using directories like Crunchbase, which are the investors that are executing on your vertical. Try to see the ones that are investing in your type of deal. So for example, if you're doing healthcare, try to pitch venture capital firms or angel investors that are uh, investing in healthcare, uh, not the ones that are investing, for example, in FinTech. It's like asking a soccer player to play a, a basketball game. It's just not gonna happen. So uh, keep that in mind so that you're really able to optimize the investment of time that you're putting in, 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 in really fundraising. So, Let's see the next question. The next question comes from Sean, and he's saying, my team is remote. Will this be an issue with getting funding? So I think, Sean, that that's a really interesting question. I think that there, there's, there's different opinions, I would say, on that. I can give you mine. Um, I've been in communication with investors in the past, 
And basically, what the what at the beginning we did have, we were outsourcing part of the technology. And I remember I where I went and pitched them a one bis. This was back in the day. They would say, "Look, Alejandro, I love what you're doing, but you really need an engineering team. Uh, so when you have an in-house engineering team, come back to me." So uh, thanks to that, I was able to get on board the 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 guys that I have sitting next to me. That uh, I I love them. I have to say, I don't know if they're listening, but anyways, it's a, it's very important that uh, that you really have the the right people, and you cannot outsource the core uh, parts of your business. Otherwise, that is adding more risk to that investor, and you really want to um, take out all the walls and all the hurdles uh, because really investors, what they are asking themselves is why not to invest in your company? It's like what, like that's really the question that they have in their minds. So you really uh, need to take out all those red flags so that they can really come forward and, and make the transaction. So let's see the next question. So let's see, let's see. So the, the, the next one is from Purvi. And Purvi is asking, how do you qualify your investors as a startup? Uh, so basically, to your question, you can qualify them. Uh, I mean, if you use, let's say, online platforms like ours, the best way to do that is when you're receiving the request of that person to, for example, have access to your materials, uh, which you, know, you cannot, you, you, you don't have to make public if you don't want to. You can actually do due diligence on that individual. You can see their social media profile. You can see who they are, uh, how they're going to be able to provide value. If you see yourself uh, sharing your journey with that investor and so forth. Here's the thing. It, it, this is a recommendation there for everyone. When you are getting an investor uh, involved, uh, it's really harder to divorce an investor than your own wife. So obviously, you need to be very careful with who you're getting into bed with. So really make sure that you're doing the right uh, checks and the right due diligence, the right due diligence on every individual. With the online world now, there is a ton of transparency, so there is no reason why uh, you wouldn't be able to find uh, information of that individual. Uh, everyone has something out there on the internet. Uh, family offices, for example, are a little bit more secretive, but there is always ways to to gain some insight and and feedback on on their operational structure and their investment thesis. So really get out there and and do some some due diligence on them before anything else. So I've been told here, guys, that uh, unfortunately we're coming to an end, and it's time to wrap this up. I really love these uh, webinar sessions and providing some some guidance and sharing some of the mistakes that I've done in the past. Uh, again, you can follow me on a Chromatis uh, on Twitter if uh, if you want to see some of the articles and the insights that I'm finding in the space. And of course, if you want to share uh, the love and the support, uh, please share the invest.onebest.com of our current round that we have opened that we're going to be closing uh, next week. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, now we're really uh, graduating to the next life cycle of the business, and we wouldn't be here if it was not for you guys. So thank you so much for believing in us, for your support, and please feel free to reach out in the event there is anything that we can help with. You can go to onebest.com slash funding. There you will see all the different uh, requirements to be able to um, to be part of the of the one best financing piece to raise money from our platform and then if you're not ready for funding yet you can always go to cofounderslab.com you can meet the other talent you can meet other advisors and then as well other interns so thank you so very much and i hope that you all have a great rest of the week take care bye bye <laughs>